and we have the honor to organize this side event under the title Human Rights in the Occupied Palestinian Terrorists Arbitrary Detention. In this side event, we have two speakers. First, Mr. Fahed Hussein. He is the general coordinator of the International Solidarity Campaign supporting prisoners and detainees in Israel occupation jails, Tadamun. And the second speaker will be Ms. Ines Osman. She is the coordinator of the legal department at Karama. Al Karama will launch her important report uh, 2014 about the Israel operation against Gaza. Now we will listen to Ms. Inas Osman, the coordinator of the legal department at Al Karama, which will uh, they will launch their uh, important report about 2014 operation against Gaza. You can start. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you all for, for being here. Um, so as uh, Mr. Safa said, I will be presenting al Karama's latest public report uh, on the 2014 operation Protective Edge and the violations of the laws of war. Um, so this public report is in fact based on a submission to the UN Commission of Inquiry on the 2014 Gaza conflict. As you may know, this Commission of Inquiry was set up on 23 July 2014 by the Human Rights Council and has the mandate to investigate all violations of international humanitarian law and human, and human rights law in the occupied Palestinian territories in the context of the military operations of last summer. Uh, the Commission of Inquiry is due to present its report next Monday here at the Council. However, it recently requested the President of the Council to postpone it to the June session. So, <clears throat> turning to why we decided to write this report. So, as you, as you all know, on 8 July 2014, Israel launched its Operation Protective Edge, which is the longest military offensive on the Gaza Strip since the withdrawal of Israel in 2005. After 51 days of intensive bombardments, rocket mortar fire, and a ground operation across the Strip, the operation ended on 26 August after an open-ended ceasefire was agreed upon. According to UN figures, uh, the operation claimed more than 2,200 lives, 70% of whom were civilians, displaced almost half, half a million people, which is a third of the Gaza population, uh, and damage, of course, hundreds of civilian buildings such as schools, hospitals, health facilities, infrastructure, including numerous power stations and factories. Um, so, between October and December 2014, Al Karama's research team in the Gaza Strip um, gathered hundreds of testimonies from survivors and witnesses on 62 assaults that left 280 <coughs> civilians dead and destroyed numerous civilian objects. Based on this first-hand information, we contend that this death resulted from serious violations of international humanitarian law, since the attacks were both indiscriminate and disproportionate, and thus that these violations amount to war crimes. Um, taking the reasoning a little further, we also contend that these violations could also amount to crimes against humanity due to the widespread scale and systematic pattern. Um, so here, I won't be presenting uh, all the cases that are in the report. Uh, we documented for the death of civilians themselves, 38 attacks, which amounted to 280 deaths. Um, however, you can clearly see when you go through all these cases that Israel was targeting civilian residential buildings during the operation. Um, so all the deaths that we have documented resulted from aerial attacks, either from missiles or artillery shells fired towards a house or a neighborhood, causing the death of the civilians living in it. 
in almost all cases, no warning or at least no effective warning was provided before the attack and none of the persons killed were reported to be combatants. It must also be noted uh, that the authorities never provided any explanation as to why a certain house or neighborhood was being targeted. Um, so now, if we talk a bit about numbers. Um, so in the cases that we've documented, we found that 128 victims were children, so under 18, which amount to 46% of the victims, almost, almost half of them. And 33, um, 73% of the children victim were actually less than 10. Uh, and in fact, if we look at the total number of victims, we also realize that a third of the total number of victims were children under 10, so a pretty high proportion. Um, among the adult casualties, uh, we, <clears throat> we found that 63% of the adults were married. This means, considering the fact that the average family size is just over uh, six people per household in Gaza, that it sort of reflects the large scale of orphans generated by the operation. Uh, the UN estimated that up to 1,500 orphans were generated by the operation, which basically means that there were 30, about 30 orphans uh, every day. In terms of how the attacks uh, were conducted, we found that almost 70% of the attacks occurred between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m., so at night, and including 38% between 1 a.m. and 7, 7 a.m., meaning that over a third of the attacks were conducted when the population was asleep. Moreover, 94% uh, of the, the cases we documented did not receive any warning, uh, although we have to note that two out of the four warnings were given at night, respectively at 1 a.m. and 4 a.m. Uh, and, but I will go back to that uh, later in, in the presentation, the roof knocking method was used to warn civilians and was not in fact understood by them uh, as, as a warning and a sign for them, for them to leave. Um, so now if we look at the, the principle of international humanitarian law, then this will be a very basic presentation for all the IHL experts in this room. Uh, but so to ensure the, the protection of the civilian population and objects from the, the effects of the hostilities, IHL, so International Humanitarian Law, demands that the parties to the conflict respect three fundamental principles of distinction, proportionality, and pre precaution. Um, so the, the principle of distinction requests that the parties distinguish between the civilian population and combatants and between civilian objects and military objectives and that accordingly they shall direct their operations only against military objectives. According to the principle of proportionality, launching an attack which may be expected to cause incidental loss of civilian life or injury to civilians, damage to civilian objects, which would be excessive, um, is prohibited. And finally, according to the principle of precaution against the effect of the attacks, a uh, statement must take all measures of precaution in the choice of means and methods of attack with a view to avoiding incidental loss of civilian lives. We, we argue throughout the report that these uh, core principles were violated uh, during the operation. If we... Um, Look, I mean, the proportionality and distinction principle have to be assessed by looking at the likelihood of a high concentration of civilians in the area in which the operation is conducted, and also if we look at the means of attack, so the weapons uh, that were used. Um, regarding the, the principle of distinction, as I previously highlighted, most attacks targeted the homes of Palestinian civilians in full knowledge of their presence. Nonetheless, this did not prevent the Israeli forces from, targeted res from targeting uh, residential buildings. Um, furthermore, in, in the cases we've documented, most deaths resulted from the use of explosive weapons as clearly evidenced by the death certificates that we've managed to gather, which show that the individuals died from severe shrapnel wounds, demonstrating the indiscriminate nature of, of these attacks. 
On top of that, after the, the Operation Protective Edge, the ICRC um, issued a statement in which it said that the use of such weapons in populated areas where there is a strong likelihood of indiscriminate effects due to their imprecision or large, large blast and fragmentation range is unacceptable. We need to recall here that um, Gaza, with over 5,000 inhabitants per square kilometers, is one of the most density, um, densely populated area in the, in the world. Finally, we also believe that Israel, I mean, having one of the most powerful armies in the world and endowed with advanced intelligence gathering systems, military technology, is technically able to achieve its military objectives in a way that respect IHL. Ironically enough, I mean, the fact that attacks were also carried out using drones, which are high precision launching devices, speaks for itself. Uh, it demonstrates that Israel tactics of war were employed deliberately and shows Israel recklessness, if not willingness, in selecting tactics that are deadly for civilians. Turning now to the, the violations of the principle of proportionality, um, according to this principle of EHL, which forbids the parties from committing acts that are illicit because of their excessive character and the absence of real strategic benefit, benefit for the attacker, um, the Israeli Defense Forces should have anticipated the loss of civilian lives in the way they conducted their operation. Most attacks, as I mentioned earlier, were carried out in the evenings or night, Recalling here that over two-thirds of the attacks occurred between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. at a time where people are normally at home, if not sleeping. In these conditions, it's difficult to believe um, that the IDF was not aware of the presence of civilians in these residential buildings they were targeting. And it seems difficult to imagine what type of military advantage uh, they could have gained from such losses of life. Finally, regarding the, the principle of precaution, which, um, I mean, according to which an effective advance warning must be given to prior to launching the attack, in almost all cases we've documented, no warning was given showing that this principle of precaution was voluntarily disregarded. In one case, um, the Israeli Defense Forces used the roof knocking technique, which basically consists of firing rubber bullet on the roof of the house prior to the attack. However, the inhabitants of that house did not understand that this was a sign to leave, especially considering the fact that the warning was given at night when everybody was sleeping. In fact, in 2009, uh, the fact-finding mission on the Gaza conflict had concluded that this very technique that may cause on top of that, terror and confuse the affected civilians uh, was forbidden and that the very idea that an attack, because the roof knocking in itself is also a small attack, could be understood as an effective warning was completely rejected by the, by the mission. So in, <clears throat> basically to, to conclude on this, this, this first um, part, the, the death that we documented um, all resulted from serious violations of IHL. None of the cases could be justified under these principles, and saying the contrary would entail that the military strategy is even one of collective punishment against the civilian population. Um, of course, the official, the official position of Israel has been uh, all along that combatants were hiding within the civilian population that they use as human shields and so on, and that therefore the collateral damages were inevitable and are Hamas's responsibility. However, international jurisprudence has already found in similar circumstances that a high proportion of civilian victims goes against such a statement uh, made by the, the party to the conflict. Moreover, for the sake of the argument, even if human shields were used, it does not absolve the Israeli forces from abiding by the principles of IHL. As it is impossible that the attacking forces did not know of the presence of civilians um, in, this, in these buildings they were targeting, the principle of protection of civilians makes it impossible to attack them. Um, finally, I would like to add that despite the very, light, the very large coverage uh, from the very first days of the operation, uh, I mean the coverage of civilian death and the violations that were committed, the political leadership and the military command did not change the means of attack as to, present, as to prevent further uh, violations. 
now in the report, we've, we've not only documented um, death of civilians, but we've also documented attacks on civilian obje objects. Um, 24 in total, including, I mean, hospitals, schools, but also nursery, charities, industries, and, and so on. I will focus here, and I'll, I'll leave you to, to read the report to, to see the rest, but I will focus here only on hospitals and UNRWA schools that were used to shelter displaced persons during the conflict. Um, so regarding the attacks on hospitals, we've documented in the report an attack on the Beit Hanun Hospital, uh, which was targeted by artillery shells. Uh, on the night of the 25, 26 July 2014. So, I mean, of course, the hospital was filled with patients at the time of the attack and also served as a shelter for displaced persons because the area was under, under heavy attacks. Um, so on the night between the 25 and 26 July, areas, as I said, around the hospitals were constantly targeted, causing severe damage to the, uh, to the hospital itself. At 11 p.m., uh, the hospital became directly targeted before it was requested after several calls to the ICRC to evacuate within 20 minutes. In addition to clearly not leaving enough time to evacuate patients uh, who were being there and civilians who were sheltering there, the indirect shelling actually never stopped around the hospital, which made it literally way too dangerous to evacuate anyone in these conditions. Um, although hospitals enjoy special protection under IHL, it appears from the facts that the Beit Hanun Hospital was directly um, targeted, I mean, in this attack, in the course of a deliberate um, aerial attack by the IDF. Moreover, all the precautions uh, to respect IHL were not followed. As I said, Israel presented absolutely no evidence, for example, that the hospital let's say, had div diverted from its humanita humanitarian duties. And even so, a 20 minutes warning after several calls from the ICRC does not qualify as a proper warning. Um, finally, the attacks on the, the UN UNRWA schools. I mean, this case has been uh, widely documented, and I'm sure some of you already know about them. Um, but as you know, so the UNRWA schools uh, were used during the conflict as shelter uh, for displaced, internally displaced uh, persons. We documented the case of two schools uh, which were attacked, the one in Beit Hanun and the one in Jabalia, uh, the refugee camp. Um, for regarding the Beit Hanun school, the, the UNRWA commissioner, after the attack, after the attack on, on that school, stated that the precise location of the schools, all the schools, and the fact that they were housing th thousands of IDPs had been communicated to Israel 17 times. However, the Beit Hanun school was hit by mortar shells on 24 July at 3 p.m. without any warning, and the Jabalia school was hit on 30 July at 5 a.m., resulting in the death of about 20 people. Uh, in both cases, the facilities were attacked by the IDF with, of course, the full knowledge that they were serving as a shelter for persons displaced by the conflict. Their attacks, therefore, clearly constitute a violation of the principle of distinction. In addition, no prior warning was given, um, and the IDF at least willfully or at least recklessly took the decision to attack the schools without giving these displaced, displaced persons the possibility to escape. Um, so, to conclude, I mean, this report presents like a wide documentation of violations uh, of international humanitarian law by the, the Israeli Defense Forces. It is alarming to recall that 70% of the casualties were vulnerable people, including elderly women and children, with children under 10, as I said in the introduction, representing a third of the casualties. No warnings or no effective warnings were given to the victims during the whole um, duration of the operation. From the patterns described, it appears that a policy of house targeting was implemented during the operation. The attacks conducted were indiscriminate, disproportionate, and did not abide by the principle of precaution. Even schools and hospitals, which enjoy a special protection under IHL, have not, be, have not been spared. 
it's extremely worrisome to see that unlawful tactics of war that endangered so heavily the life of civilians were employed deliberately and showed the recklessness, if not the willingness, to select such ta tactics. All the deaths and destruction caused stem from serious disrespect for the very core principles of IHL, um, and we, in fact, argue that these violations amount to war crime and may even, as I said in the beginning, amount to crimes against humanity due to their widespread scale and systematic patterns. Um, the report finally, I mean, it aims not only at calling upon the Commission of Inquiry to fully inquire uh, these violations, but also <laughs> it aims at calling upon all the stakeholders, whether it's um, UN member states, the civil society, and so on, to support also the investigation that was opened by the International Criminal Court in January 2015, so that those responsible are held to account. Thank you.